so uh, this is a, a psychologist's perspective on um, conceptual and methodological uh, issues in the scientific study of humility. And I realize we have many um, uh, philosophers, and I want to say I would have been very, very much influenced by the opportunity to work with philosophers through the John Templeton Foundation. And much of what I'll be talking about today, um, I think, links up and was informed by um, our experiences through uh, Pete Hill's uh, multi-site study on intellectual humility. Um, so just a little bit of background. Um, for many years, uh, 20th century psychology was focusing on big problems. Um, there were, was much concern about the two big wars, about the Holocaust, about the level of violence and aggression in society. And so we spent a lot of time focusing on negative things. Um, bad behavior. So you see up in the uh, upper right-hand corner the classic Bobo doll experiment of kids hitting Bobo dolls after watching violent television, um, the Milgram experiment, the Stanford prison experiment, and such. Um, and so we were really focused on the negative for many, many years. And um, positive psychology arrived in psychology essentially in 1998, so not just maybe 30 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, and this was Marty Seligman's theme for his term as president of APA. And it brought along a new interest in, among psychologists in character strengths and virtues, which had been largely um, just relegated to God knows what uh, prior to that. Um, and what, we set, what we've seen is um, just really an explosion of research in forgiveness and gratitude and hope and optimism, and most recently in intellectual and general humility, much of this funded by the John Templeton Foundation. So humility, of all the character strengths and virtues, humility really stands out as one of the most humble and neglected. Um, and I think there's a, you know, a number of reasons for this. Um, one key factor hindering scientific study of humility has been the problem of measurement. Um, uh, until uh, relatively recently, there was no widely accepted definition of humility among psychologists. I know that the philosophers will be debating this for millennia, um, but we, we try to get we try to get consensus so we can measure something, um, and then we didn't because we didn't have a definition. We didn't have a widely accepted, reliable, valid measures of humility, and part, this really is a big problem because if you can't define it, you can't measure it. And if you can't measure it, you can't study it. Um, so what is humility? Um, many people have spoken about the um, low self-esteem view, and I think that's held by many um, laypersons who are unfamiliar with the rich literature that we have been talking about here um, over the last couple days. And um, you've seen the Oxford English uh, Dictionary definition focusing on lowliness, humbleness, the opposite of pride or haughtiness. Um, and in other dictionaries, I want to point out, um, humility is simply defined as the state of being humble. <laughs> okay? And humble, as you've seen, really is pretty negative. I mean, we're talking of little worth, unimportant, common, lacking self-esteem, having a sense of insignificance, unworthiness, dependence, or sinfulness, meek, penitent, not me, I don't want that. Um, and I think we need a new word, actually. Uh, humile <laughs> would be helpful as an adjective describing humility as opposed to humble, which I think raises up all kinds of um, uh, baggage that, uh, sort of linguistic baggage. OK, so in contrast to the low self-esteem view, theologists, philosophers, and more recently, uh, psychological scientists portray humility in, a much, in much more positive terms and as a rich, multifaceted concept. Um, back in 2000, um, I got together with a bunch of undergraduates. We did a directed readings and just read the literature um, in psychology. Um, we also looked at the philosophy literature, um, theology, and then um, were really influenced by uh, Sir John Templeton's Laws of Life. And um, I want to point out that this is not the be-all and end-all um, definition of, of humility. Um, other people have um, their own definitions, but one common theme across different definitions of humility is that they tend to be multifaceted. And um, there's a lot of overlap in the um, kinds of um, sort of sub-dimensions that seem to people talk about as comprising um, humility. 
Okay. So today I'll, I'll just be talking about um, my initial take on this, um, which is certainly open to revision. Um, and uh, based on our review of the literature, we thought that the key elements of humility that kept popping up across um, different disciplines, different writings, and like that is first of all this accurate assessment of one's abilities and achievements. Not under assessment, but an accurate assessment. Um, Secondly, a willingness to acknowledge mistakes, gaps in knowledge, and limitations. Um, third, uh, an uh, openness to new ideas, to contradictory information, and also to advice. Um, and then this low self-focus, this forgetting of the self, this um, focus more on the outside as opposed to on me, myself, what everything means about me and how it reflects on me. Um, and then there's this notion of um, keeping one's abilities and accomplishments, one's place in the world, in perspective. One may be very accomplished in one area, uh, but there are other people who are well accomplished too, and there's other things that we can't do as well, and sometimes don't do as very well at all. Um, and along with that comes an appreciation of the value of all people, the notion that everyone has unique gifts and talents. Um, even if they don't match our, our own. So that's kind of my initial take, our initial take on, on what uh, comprises humility. And you'll see that some measures um, focus on um, just one component of humility. For example, this um, accurate self-evaluation, that's something that um, people can evaluate. So pe people, participants will uh, describe, uh, rate themselves on some characteristic, and then you get an alternative source and look at how accurate they are. Uh, but one thing to note about this is that that's just one piece of the pie. And actually, this is a construct where all of these different pieces um, are kind of interconnected and inform one another encourage one another, and it's really the whole that's much greater than the sum of the parts. Um, another way to think about this in statistical terms or conceptual statistical terms is using latent variable kinds of models. And the typical model is on, that you see in latent variable models is on the, the I always get left and right wrong, the left side, um, where humility is a whole that is reflected in multiple items. And we see this like, for example, with self-esteem. That self-esteem is a pretty nice, tight construct, and you can ask it in 10 different ways. I feel good about myself in general. I'm uh, you know, worth uh, as much as other people, that kind of thing. Um, and so this construct is reflected in the items. I think humility really is more of a formative variable where humility is not just reflected in these different pieces, but it is kind of the sum of the parts, the whole, um, or at least some subset of, of these uh, multiple dimensions. OK, so an important question then is um, we, we can talk about what humility is. It's also important to know what humility is not, to, what are the boundaries around the construct. And that's something Jason Baer um, spoke so eloquently about um, yesterday's, um, in yesterday's morning session. So uh, humility is not low self-esteem. It's not an underestimate of one's abilities or accomplishments or worth. Um, humility is related to, but distinct from modesty. Uh, modesty focuses on moderate estimates of personal merits or achievements, so kind of lower. And um, it also extends to proprietary, propriety in um, behavior and dress, which is kind of irrelevant to humility as we talk about it, so physical modesty. And so it's really uh, a construct that's both too narrow because it misses fundamental components of humility as we're thinking about it, and it's also too broad because it relates to bodily exposure and other dimensions of propriety that really are irrelevant to humility per se. Um, one question is whether um, there's an opposite to humility. I know this has come up a little bit yesterday. 
Um, is humility a unipolar construct where people are either lo you know, low or very low on humility or very high on humility and there's a range there? Or is it bipolar where humility is on the high end and something else is on the low end? There's an opposite, um, for example, narcissism. Um, and I want to argue that narcissism is really not the opposite of humility. Um, narcissists clearly lack humility. Okay, there's no question about that. They're very self-focused and often self-aggrandizing. Um, but the absence of narcissism can't be equated with the presence of humility. So there are people who are low on narcissism who may or may not have an accurate assessment of their uh, abilities and, and achievements. They may or may not have the capacity to become unselved. Um, well, they probably don't. Um, but. Uh, so it's just one piece, really, and um, so I, I don't see it as exactly the opposite, um, that you have a continuum that's, that's bipolar. What about pride? There was um, a lot of discussion about pride, and I'm rethinking, even as we speak, um, based on Jason's talk yesterday, but um, I, my, my thought is that pride is not really the opposite of humility. Um, I think a person with humility may experience well-deserved pride, first of all, in accurately assessing an achievement or um, behavior that uh, you know selects the, the better, the, the, the good road as opposed to the bad road that you're, you're attracted to and like that. And I think it's also possible to feel pride in the group and what we accomplish together um, in a very real, accurate, authentic sort of sense. Um, and I think most likely pride in group team as well as self is something that goes along with humility. Um, what about arrogance? Um, that's another um, construct that's been thought of as sort of the opposite of humility. And I want to give you an example of somebody who's not arrogant but is not humile either. So a person who is very self-deprecating, self-focused, and, and uh, 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 focused on seeking assurance. So, oh, I gave the worst talk today. You know, out of all the talks that were done at the Humility Conference, mine was really the worst. I was so nervous seeing all these philosophers that I just couldn't even listen to them. I didn't want to hear what they had to say. Um, and don't you think mine was like the worst? <laughs> that's not humility, okay? That's not arrogance, but that's not humility. Okay, so, um, and I wonder if you all have any thoughts about other potential polar opposites of humility. Think about it, it's something we could talk about during the discussion time. Okay, um, so my, my uh, best guess is that, that it's unipolar, that we don't have to look for an opposite, and that will keep us really tight on what the construct is. Okay, so humility is not low self-esteem, it's not modesty, it's not simply a lack of narcissism or pride and such, and it's a positive multifaceted virtue that's likely unipolar is my guess. Okay, so how do we measure it? If we have some, at least, idea that, of what the construct is, um, why can't we ask people straight out, how much humility do you have? Or how humble are you? on a one to five scale. Um, we can ask about other important constructs straight out. Um, how satisfied are you with your life? People respond to that. Um, just a couple items will do it. How is your health? Single item, best really, really strong predictor of mor mortality. Um, so we can ask other things straight out. But why not humility? And one of the problems is that people are apt to misunderstand what we're asking. So if people are thinking the low self-esteem account, um, we're, we're not talking about the same thing. We're not assessing the same thing. Um, and even worse with humble. How humble are you? Um, that I think people are not going to be thinking about humile <laughs> the way that we are thinking about it. So measurement, um, by its nature, uh, humility has real challenges uh, in this area, and it's something that I never had the guts to um, address and, and attempt, but I'm delighted that Pete Hill and many others have in the last few years especially. Um, and 
Uh, I, I do want to say I've been very much influenced by this multi-site project funded by the Templeton Foundation to look at intellectual and general humility. Um, and what I've seen from uh, that project and from others who are doing work um, in, in the field now, it's um, really starting to become a, a much more popular uh, topic for research in psychology, is that people are using essentially five different approaches to measuring dispositional humility. So I'm not going to talk about state humility today. Um, so generally, how much do people have humility on a you know, continuum? Um, and people use self-reports. They use uh, a comparison between self-evaluations and other sources, uh, informant ratings, uh, behavioral ob observations, and the implicit association test. And I'll go through each briefly and just talk about what they are and what some of the pros and cons are of each approach. So self-report, beyond how much humility do you have, um, it's possible to come up with self-report measures that tap into these multiple components of humility. Um, and before we get into how to do that, I want to give a caution about um, several measures that, early measures, that pop up in the literature a fair amount. The, um, the values in action uh, 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 measure and the hexaco measure that comes out of, um, oh, I think IO psychology more than any place else, industrial organizational psychology. So about the VIA strengths inventory, this is um, probably the first one developed by Peterson and Seligman. There's a 10 item modesty humility subscale. And I'll give you um, an example of some of the items. People are drawn to me because I am humble. I don't know where that came from. I am proud that I am an ordinary person. I am always humble about the good things that have happened to me. Um, so not the best measure of humility. Uh, it, it doesn't hold together very well, and it doesn't really match up much with kind of more contemporary or uh, recent psychological conceptualizations. The hexaco, you'll see lots and lots of research on the hexaco, and this is sort of an extension of the five-factor personality model. They argue that there's a sixth factor, uh, which is labeled honesty, humility, and there are four facets. It's a large um, scale with four subscales, and the subscales are sincerity, fairness, greed avoidance, and modesty. Modesty meaning sincere, fair, unassuming, not sly, greedy, or pretentious. Okay, so basically, it doesn't really measure humility, okay? Modesty, th there's no humility in there. Modesty is one of four facets, and somehow it got labeled humility, modesty. And so people, because the name is in the title, use it as a measure of humility. And it's just a reminder that you really need to look at the items, not just the name of a measure. The name of a measure you know, can be very misleading. You want to go down to item level. Is it getting at what you think of as humility? OK, so my uh, recommendations are don't use these. <laughs> OK, so for self-reports, um, there's a range of new measures that many that came out of the uh, Templeton Intellectual Humility Initiatives. Um, and so, um, yes, you know, take a look at them. There's just, they're, they're coming out now uh, in press and um, uh, I think uh, really offer a, a very rich array. Um, and to pick one that matches what you want to measure. And there are things like, not I'm humble, but uh, things like I admit when I don't know how to do something. I take notice of others' strengths. I'm willing to learn from others. So really operationalizing some of these pieces of the pie, the larger um, uh, conceptual pie for humility. So what are the pros and cons of self-report? I'm a little biased because I'm a self-report person. Um, it's easily administered, um, and it can simultaneously ca uh, capture multiple components of humility as opposed to just one piece of the pie. Some of the cons are you tend to have low internal consistency. I think that's because it's a multifaceted construct. Um, there's the, always the question of social desirability, um, so something to watch out for. 
uh, and, and control for, although um, initial results suggest that controlling for social desirability doesn't change the results much at all. Um, it does require some honest insight um, you know, into one's experiences on a day-to-day -day basis. And it, it is less applicable to young uh, respondents and to people with limited vocabulary, English vocabulary. OK, another approach. Discrepancies between self-ratings and other sources. So the other source could be an ob objective measure of achievement. So one person could rate you know, themselves on how good they are academically, and then we could look at their grades. Um, coaches' ratings of, ab of ability, supervisor ratings of performance, peer ratings. Um, people have used a lot of different sources. So um, the pros for this um, kind of approach is it, it's a really, really good operationalization of accuracy if you've got a good other source. No question about that. Um, one of the cons is that it's expensive. You have to get um, data from another source that is familiar with the participant or that's relevant to what was rated. Um, and you can only assess one piece of that humility pie, the accuracy and self-perception, not the other pieces that are, might be in your definition. Informant ratings, this is another approach where um, a significant other, a friend, a teacher, an employer, or an employee um, completes a humility scale from the perspective of the target. So how do you think so-and-so would answer this? Or how do you see so-and-so um, that way? Um, and, and that's a really um, kind of exciting approach. Um, one thing is that there seems to be a, a high convergence between self-reports and, and romantic partner reports. Um, there's substantially low, lower correspondence um, for casual acquaintances, coworkers, and friends. So in terms of the pros and cons of this approach, um, you can assess multiple components of humility simultaneously, so get different pieces of the pie. Um, it circumvents social desirability problems. It circumvents that paradoxical dilemma of, you know, how much are you evaluating yourself and reflecting on yourself when part of humility is being unselfed and not being so self-focused. Um, but some of the cons are that it's expensive. I mean, it's expensive to go out and get um, significant others' ratings, you know, as opposed to just ratings uh, from self-report. Um, and it has to be somebody who's really familiar with the person across multiple contexts, like a romantic partner. Um, just a casual acquaintance is not going to be very tuned in to the level of a person's empathy. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, humility. All right, behavioral observations. So another thing we can do is instead of asking people or asking significant others, we can just observe people's behavior and have behavioral markers of Humility. So things like acknowledges limits in, in, in knowledge, you know, in their maybe discussions with other people or in their writings. Um, attends to information that's contrary to beliefs. That's something you could do in an experimental study. Um, expressing appreciation towards others. Um, so you could think of a lot of other behavioral observations that might be markers of um, some of these different pieces of the conceptual pie. Pros and cons, well, it circumvents social desirability bias. Um, you know, you're watching what people are doing. They're not necessarily uh, aware that you're observing. Um, it circumvents that paradoxical dilemma of reflecting on the self. But again, this is an expensive approach, and it assesses only one piece of the humility pie. Each one of these. Now, you could have multiple observations, but that would get awfully expensive. All right, and then um, the implicit attitude test, um, or I'm sorry, implicit association test. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with this, probably not most of the philosophers. Um, it's an attempt to get at implicit, not explicit beliefs or attitudes, and it was first developed um, in trying to assess implicit uh, racism. Um, but it's been expanded to use in a lot of different areas, and so it's a computerized assessment. Um, people see on the screen words that are associated with humility or arrogance, 
and they're briefly con uh, presented in conjunction with the self or some other person. And the measure is uh, of reaction time. And so if you, th if you think of yourself as, as being arrogant, um, you'll, you'll hit much more quickly when self and arrogant are paired together than self and humility or vice versa. Um, so the pros of this um, implicit ad association test, the IAT, is that it circumvents social desirability bias, the paradoxical dilemma. It's relatively convenient and inexpensive. It can be done via computer. It can be done, you know, long distance over the computer. Um, cons are um, two-week stabilities are low, so people who retake this two weeks later don't get the same scores. Um, it requires knowledge of the definition of humility, if you have humility words, humility, humble, that kind of thing. Um, and it doesn't correlate with self, uh, informant reports, uh, which is of some concern in terms of validity. Okay, so what's the best measure of dispositional humility? Um, can't say. I think it really depends on um, your definition of humility and what you want to zero in on. But you've got, you know, there are multiple, multiple approaches, and you just want to think about the match and how much of humility you're getting, and is that what you want? So I'm going to uh, close with a few cautions going forward. Um, one thing is to be careful to avoid redundancy between the measure of humility and the outcome of humility. So when we start looking at what humility predicts, um, we want to be careful that there's not contamination between the independent variable and the dependent variable. So for example, if I'm interested in um, acknowledging limits, and one of the items on my self-report measure is, I seek new information when uncertain. One to five, okay, rate that. That's part of the measure. Then what you can't do is see how that measure predicts whether people are going to seek new information when uncertain out in the world, right? Because it's just redundant with what you already asked them. So these behavioral markers can't be in the self-report measure. You have to be careful that there's, uh, the, the outcome is distinct from what it is that you're measuring when you measure humility. Um, another caution is to be careful, and this was uh, Jason, uh, Jason's point uh, earlier, uh, not to expand humility to include other related but distinct constructs. It's something that psychologists call construct creep. Thank you. Um, so one example is um, appreciation of others. Well, gee, if I appreciate others, the logic goes, well, then I would have empathy for them, maybe? And so let's include empathy in the measure of appreciation for others. Well, empathy is a different construct, and it's got a whole literature, so that's one thing. Now we're mushing together two things that don't um, really belong together. These are distinct constructs. And what it does is it precludes our opportunity to look at if, in fact, empathy leads, or I'm sorry, humility leads to empathy. We can't do that if empathy is part of the assessment. Okay, so some uh, summary and future directions. Humility is a rich, multifaceted construct with potential important implications um, for many aspects of life. Um, much recent work has been devoted to measurement development, and we really have the tools now to um, tackle some really, really big questions. Questions that we've been dying to get at for, what, years now. Um, and just a few that stand out for me. Um, in what specific context is humility adaptive and via what mechanisms? Are there circumstances in which humility is a liability? Um, uh, what are the implications of humility for leadership? How and in what domain? Certainly very relevant today. Um, are there gender and or cultural differences in the meaning and implications of humility? And then how can we um, help parents and teachers and therapists foster an adaptive sense of humility. So I'd like to thank the John Templeton Foundation for um, the support in this, um, this adventure. Um, Pete Hill, who has been uh, sort of mentor and uh, guide.
and uh, the intellectual humility philosophers and psychologists in that group, and also Laura Weimer, who helped me with, I can't do these pictures, so she was really helpful with that. So thank you very much.